Hey everybody, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys. Every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, we talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, uh, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, but mostly we talk about how to grow it and the weird and interesting fruits and vegetables that you have probably never heard of. We love to talk about figs. Um, in today's episode of Fruit Talk, we are going to be talking about why I believe this is probably one of the best times in history to start a farm or an orchard. And also my plans that I'm doing right now to do that myself. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I... Uh, as a uh, at my full-time job right now and it's been like this for years since I graduated was uh, to be an accountant and I've been an accountant at a family firm and we do taxes for a living we do we do tax returns for mostly small businesses we we don't really do um, too many in, well we do a lot of individuals but most of the, of the people we deal with are our small businesses so we we really care about small business as a family as um, as I was raised to care about small business and to care about business and to be an entrepreneur my grandparents were entrepreneurs in Philadelphia and they owned all kinds of barber shops and my grandfather owned donut shops and all kinds of weird different things and ventures that he went into he was a barber by trade and he he owns some commercial real estate and um, you know he sort of passed that legacy in that I guess that uh, that entrepreneurial spirit down to us my father then started his own business my uncle owns his own business and now um, myself you could say that I have my own business now with uh, this brand that I've created through my YouTube channel my blog, my podcast, selling plants, offering consulting services. So we are uh, definitely entrepreneurs at heart. We really do, as a family, live and breathe the American dream. And um, I have certainly been, uh, one of my passions has been throughout my entire life is business. Um, so it's not just it's been to my family and then I do it. I studied it. I went to school for it. I was very interested in it even throughout high school. Um, I got into different business classes. Then I got myself an accounting degree. I'm also studying for the CPA exam, which is a certified public accountant to then be able to uh, better handle some of our business clients, our small business clients, to actually eventually become what my dad does right now. Um, which is a CPA. So, um, knowing all this, I think I have a pretty good perspective on business. And uh, I also, although this is a food-related podcast and it's about gardening and growing and um, and things of that nature, I'm also really heavily invested or er, uh, interested in investing. And um, I do take investing quite seriously. Um, put a lot of time and energy into it and I know a lot of you guys who've been following me now for years may not have ever really known that you know somebody who is 29 I'm 29 now um, there isn't too many people I guess nowadays they're sort of getting into it but I've been doing investing my uh, most of my adult life now so um, I've put a lot of thought into investing and the business side of things and now what I'm trying to do as a as an adult is not just only get my CPA license and become an, a, a you know a super accountant, I guess you could call it, um, but also to uh, to own my own business, which is what it is right now. But continue that and to expand it and to um, eventually have my own land that I can then plant fruit trees and have gardens and sell the actual things that I grow to then make uh, additional income you know this this whole thing is really a part of uh, an additional income 
not necessarily my main source of income yet. However, it would I would of course love it if that were to be the case at some point in the future. So um that's what we've been we've been focusing on here uh the last few years and people have given me um I think quite a bit of uh a lot of some of you guys have given me quite a bit of support, but I've also had on the flip side some people have actually been um, jealous and scolding me and um, and telling me it's not really right uh, to be doing what it is that I'm doing to have a entrepreneurial business mindset in the f in, in 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 conjunction with a YouTube channel, which to me is completely mind blowing. How um, that makes any sense, but I assume it all kind of ties into jealousy. Um, but you know, those people are going to do whatever they want to do and they're, and you're always going to have some haters. So I always like to say for those of you guys out there who want to put your opinions forth is that you're going to be scrutinized. You're going to be judged. You're going to have people who think they know who you are and they think they know something about you when in reality, they really know absolutely nothing. In fact, um, it's kind of crazy how even some of you guys who are my loyal fans, um, how little you really know about me. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, we're on this path and this is the path that I want to go on and it just so happens that now what's happening in the world with the coronavirus and how that's affecting business is now opening many doors for people like me who are interested in getting into this business, into actually growing food to then sell it. And I, you know, I didn't always have aspirations for really any of this. I didn't even want this to be a business. It was originally a hobby. Um, but I realized how amazing this particular thing is. I, may, I realized you can make money at it, so why not? Why not do it? If you can make money at something you love, it doesn't make sense not to. Um, if the passion's there, people will follow. And uh, I think that if anything you can learn from me, it's that right there. So if you have any excitement, any passion for whatever it is, even if it's something as crazy, boring, as extremely boring as knitting, no offense to anyone who knits out there, but that's what I would describe as probably the most boring thing you could do at least most people would probably agree. But if there's somebody out there who is very passionate and excited about knitting and they can show me that passion and excitement, I might be interested and I may reconsider my point of view on knitting. So um, it's the same thing with growing food. And I think that's why a lot of you guys are here listening to me right now. So let's get into some of the reasons why I think this is a really great time. So whatever that's, you know, everything that's going on in the world right now, um, we're sort of at a low. We're not really at the lowest of the lows, I think, just yet. There's a lot of people going bankrupt, filing for bankrupt. I mean, J.C. Penney just filed for bankrupt. Um, we've already, as the United States, have put out quite a bit of money into stimulus packages and bailouts to help a lot of these big companies um, to prevent them from failing. And there's a whole lot of economics that can be really just injected into this conversation about why that's good or why that's bad. And um, I don't really want to get into that, but that is that is what we're doing, is that we are basically bailing out big companies. And in my estimation, in the future, uh, maybe not this second, but in the near future, we're probably going to have to continue to bail out big companies um, of specific industries and of specific uh, practices. You know, um, a lot of these companies, as an example, before this all this craziness happened, they bought a lot of their own stock to boost the price of their stock uh, right before um, things got crazy. So a lot of these companies spent a ton of cash um, that they didn't necessarily need to, all in an effort to artificially promote the price of their of their stock, and um, that is cer certainly something that has contributed to the financial um, heartache of a lot of these big companies. Um, 
So a lot of them are not just affected by, I think, the fact that no one is really buying their products or using their services, but also the fact that they have sort of put themselves in a hole. Some of these companies were just entirely fiscally irresponsible, financially irresponsible. Um, now we're seeing in the last couple months that a lot of airlines, I mean, that's a big one, f the food industry in particular, um, anywhere where people have to be very close together, like big venues and concerts and movie theaters and things like that, are just not doing any business whatsoever. Um, people are still buying things, which is nice, and people still need food, which is nice. And it seems like this might be one of the very few times in history where you have such a thing like a pandemic, where people are then afraid um, or or uh, the food system is being affected in such a great way. So, you know, as an example, everybody needs food. They're always going to always need food. You're never going to not have a demand for food. That's why having a farm or an orchard or selling food is such a great business model in itself because it's never going to suffer. However, there is one example which is happening right now where you can't access restaurants restaurants are no longer in business um, most of them didn't open if they did they changed their business models and actually we have some clients that we have some clients that own some Popeye's chickens and uh, they have done exceptionally well they've done like 20,000 more um, in revenues just in the last couple months because they started delivering their chicken to people rather than um, having a storefront that was open. So they really uh, were entrepreneurial and they got ahead of this thing and they actually were making more money than before all this happened. So, you know, I think some companies and businesses obviously are, are taking different steps, but as a whole, everybody is really suffering um, because we can't really go to these restaurants. And um, as a result, when you have less restaurants, you have less customers, you need less food for these restaurants. And therefore, all these people and all these farmers who are farming then and growing food for these restaurants, they're not able to sell their products. And looking here actually at uh, one of the best uh, or one of the, the top restaurants in New York City owned by Dan Barber, he has a farm that's associated with his uh, his restaurant. He grows a lot of the food at his farm that he then uses in the restaurant. And um, it's a beautiful model. It's a great thing. Uh, the guy has certainly done some good things for food. Uh, and he's posted here on, I guess, uh, this particular website, some things that he has uh, surveyed of farmers and what he particularly thinks, I guess. Um, or I guess this is not really from his point of view, but um, this is definitely asking about his point of view here, this particular article and how a lot of the particular farmers um, that are growing food for restaurants uh, have either changed their, their production models or their business models and are now having even worse issues because now these restaurants are not open and uh, a lot of people are going to have to go bankrupt. And he says even in, the, in this particular thing here, that there was a um, 40% small farmers are the ones you want to keep around if 30 to 40% of them go that's a generational catastrophe that doesn't come back for approaching 40% of farmers the answer is bankruptcy um, and he talks about the age in which they are I think he said they're 25 to 44 in age and potentially they're not really um, you know all that uh, maybe even f financially stable in the point of their life I mean some of this is a bit um, you know I think in my opinion some of it is a bit uh, a bit drastic in terms of um, or even a bit too negative towards this particular opinion of pushing a particular agenda um, you know you can make an argument that some of this is 
just uh, a little bit of bias towards the particular statistics that are coming out. But um, he is talking directly to actual people, actual farmers. And um, some of this has got to be pretty accurate. Um, so, you know, you can't you can't really argue. And I totally agree that there is an issue with f the food system right now. Um, so when this particular thing happens in any industry, in any financial market, in any sort of investing whatsoever, um, even if you were in something like a recession, as in you were as we were in two thousand eight, um, or even if we were in let's say a depression, historically and financially, just good sound financial advice is that if you were to invest in let's say the stock market or if you were to invest in yourself or if you were to start a business after a recession after a major financial event financial event like this on a significant downturn on a significant low if you were to catch that ride back on up and you were a part of that ride back on up you're going to benefit greatly from starting at the bottom that's what investing is that's what um this is how people make themselves financially secure is they get in at the right time any investment any business venture take your house as an example why would you buy a house that's going to decline in value um your house, as an example, if you do, are buying a house, is one of the most important investments of your life. And if you quickly go into buying a particular house, maybe you're young and it doesn't go up in value, instead it depreciates in value and you're forced to sell it for whatever reason, you take a loss, um, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. So with any investing in any sort of business adve venture, you want to get in on the low. You want to get things when they're cheap. You want to buy low and sell high. That's the basics of any investing strategy. So it's the same thing here. When things are looking bad, as Warren Buffett has said, when there's blood in the streets, you want to buy, right? When there's extreme optimism in the market, you want to sell. You know, when people are elated and how things are doing so well, and you could honestly make that a pretty good... Um, I would per I don't, I don't want to get too financial with this particular podcast but you could make a pretty good argument with that particular statement there is that there's some extreme optimism in the stock market right now in the United States. So if there's extreme optimism, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to do the opposite. You're supposed to do the opposite of herd mentality. You're supposed to do what everybody else isn't doing. Um you're supposed to be a contrarian um, and that's how you benefit the most. That's how people become successful. So that's what I'm doing right now. I didn't do this on purpose. I didn't select this particular timing on purpose. I think a lot of people probably didn't select their particular timing of when to start a farm on purpose. Um, at least they didn't foresee this particular thing happening. So you can't really blame. I'm not blaming anybody. But uh, because there's so much negativity on this particular website, it got me thinking with Dan Barber's thoughts and how people are looking at you know, the beef industry and how people are looking at how meat is going and how the food, just food in general, how everybody's so negative about it. You have to think this has got to be the best time, one of the best times in history to get into an industry like this and I just consider myself lucky to have been sort of working towards this for years now to really have put these little pieces together I didn't wake up one day and say I want to sell food I want to grow figs and sell the figs for a commercial market um, I didn't even wake up one day and said I want to grow food I eventually just started out as a little hobby of growing houseplants. For those of you who don't know, we grew, we grew a bunch of houseplants just simply because our basement was flooded one year. And I work in the basement, again, at, my, at our accounting firm. And I was tired of the moldy smell. I couldn't stand it. So what did I do? I looked up on the internet how to get rid of moldy smell in your basement. 
houseplants. From there, I grew a lot of houseplants. From there, I started growing food. From there, I started growing figs. And then from there, I started growing every little piece of food that I could. And then from there, I said, you know what? Let's start a nursery. Let's start a YouTube channel. Let's start a podcast. Let's start selling figs locally. So it's uh, it's really awesome that this sort of all happened at once. I think... Um, the stars are kind of aligning for me as this is going to be my first real year that I sell any sort of fruit locally whatsoever. Um, and you know what? This isn't going to be a big year for me. This isn't going to be a big year for anybody though. So although I just started with this, we just planted 100 fig trees in the ground last spring. This year I put like another you know, 20 or so, 25, 30 in the ground. Um, you have to think well we just sort of got this whole process going we've got our land um at least here in the backyard um we've got our low tunnel set up we've got everything situated the way we want it and now we're pretty much primed and ready to then start selling this year and if our sales this year aren't phenomenal what's the big deal it's not a big deal because we're at the beginning. We're on the rise up. Next year, it only gets better and better. The trees get more and more mature. Our techniques get more and more refined. People start going back to the store, start going back to restaurants. They start connecting with their farmers again. And uh, f you know, three to five years from now, you looking back at this moment and you're saying, you know, wow, if only I could have held on to my farm just a bit longer. Or maybe I could have started that dream farm that I always wanted to start then. Um, so for me, I think that's where I'm at. And that's really what I wanted to convey to you guys is this particular um, thought process. Now, I'm even considering taking this a bit further. And because I've realized just how easy it is to grow figs, with my low tunnels and this is why I wanted to sort of bring up this topic here is that we've set up our low tunnels about a month ago we've been talking about the low tunnels and how to grow figs underneath these low tunnels we've been talking about it for uh, for a couple months now we've been talking about for a while for years I think now of getting a commercial production started how to train these trees, the different techniques, things like pinching and thinning and planting the fig tree and how we want to include as much heat as humanly possible into these fig trees to get them a higher metabolic rate, increasing the soil temperatures, having thermal mass, having them in a lot of sun, and then now having them in a greenhouse environment like these low tunnels, pruning them to a short, small tree every single winter time every fall we cut them back to 6 to 12 inches we space them two feet on center we have them very close together because we have them underneath these three foot by six foot wide low tunnels that then when they wake up march 1st we have them growing and we have them growing extremely well and we also have so much heat in there that they're then bolting they're triggering their flowers which is the fig it's an inverted flower which is then getting us a much higher earlier higher quality production of figs to then sell locally to not ship them across the country to have them local to local restaurants local customers local farmers markets at a higher quality than what california is able to produce simply because they have to ship them across the country and simply because figs are not meant to be shipped across the country these are fruits and most of the fruits that we've talked about and most of the vegetables we talked about on our first 60 episodes of Fruit Talk, what were they about? They were about one, growing food and why it's so good, but also why is it so good? Because we can pick the fruits and vegetables at the right time. So all these tree ripened fruits instead of uh, counter ripened fruits are going to be astronomically better quality. I'm going to have people lining up out the door for these things. Um, once you bite into these figs, um, 
how could you not? I, I, I really believe that. Um, these fruits are so darn good and they're so hard to find that anybody in the Northeast who knows anything about figs, has ever tried a fig, wants to try a fig, people are going to be hooked. They're going to be hooked. And um, I would even like to, if it was possible at this point, is go even further with this and try to find even more land because it really wasn't all that expensive to get myself all these fig trees to set up these low tunnels i would like to do this in an even better way there's a better way to do it than this but this is a really darn efficient and inexpensive way to grow figs in a colder place in a shorter season climate in a climate like the northeast that uh it's going to be tough to compete with someone like me. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I hope that you guys are now somewhat inspired. If you've been thinking about doing this, um, starting your own farm, starting your own orchard, why not? Uh, this is, uh, really for all the reasons I mentioned, I think this is one of the best times in history to be doing anything anything financially and the people who have cash right now and have money to to uh to sit on and can get in at the right time those are the people who are going to profit the most um until the next recession until the next depression until the next uh big event that happens in our financial markets so uh yeah i i hope it all works out for all of you guys um I know that's sort of impossible, but yeah, let's stay optimistic here and uh, I'll catch everybody for the next episode of Fruit Talk. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, consider supporting us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Additionally, for those of you guys who have been um, wondering, our podcast is now indeed on Anchor. So if you go on anchor.fm, um, and you go to anchor.fm slash Ross Ratty, you can see our public site here, which then lists all the different podcast sites it's on right now. It's on Spotify, it's on Anchor, it's on Radio Public, it's on Breaker, and it should be on Google Podcasts. Yep, it's on Google Podcasts now, and soon to be on all of the rest of these podcasting sites. So I'm excited for that. That was a really big thing that happened to me recently. And we've also just changed up our website. Once again, it's looking beautiful. This is our blog. A lot of great information here. Very happy to uh, to have this particular website looking the way it does. It's beautiful. I'm about to actually publish it on Google um, to get myself actually some recognition in some search engines and we actually just need to study our seo and get our seo plugged into this thank you john for sending me your book and uh yeah peace out everybody uh stay safe all right take care